This episode of the Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by SR3 Rescue Concepts because you don't know what you don't know. Life Saving Systems Corporation. We do our work so you can do yours. Tough gear for tough jobs. Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated helicopter hoist and winch provider. Have you taken a minute to reach out to Dave and Jason at SR3? Or what about Mario over at LSC? Or maybe Jimmy at Breeze Eastern? They're not only sponsoring this podcast, these guys are actually friends of mine. So if you have not reached out to them, now is the time. Heck, even call them just to get a t-shirt or a hat. Sport their logo and wear it proud. SR3 Rescue Concepts is a training company that can help you with your helicopter training, a standardization check, a safety check, or maybe just an audit or an annual FAA refresher. They are ready to bring your agency up to date with the current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. The training staff is awesome. With certified flight instructor pilots and experienced crew members, which I am happy to say that I am a part of, they offer training in rescue, medical, tactical, firefighting, ground operation, and night vision goggle use. SR3 has partnered with Petzl to assist with the personal protective equipment inspection course and the highly specific Lazard, which is used in helicopter, cliff, and mountain rescue, or like our guys over in Norway, who think outside the box, and they used it on a vessel that was pitching and rolling. SR3 Rescue Concepts goes beyond the helicopter world too. They also provide high angle rescue training and tactical medicine training. Contact them today at sr3rescueconcepts.com and follow them over on Instagram at sr3 underscore rescue. Then we have Life Saving Systems Corporation. They manufacture the world's toughest helicopter rescue gear. From my favorite harness as a rescueman, the Triton harness, to the rescue baskets and the litters, and of course the most popular hoist in all of helicopters, the D-Lock. The team at LSC cuts, bends, sews, welds, and machines these products into existence every day. As they like to say, we do our work so you can do yours. Tough gear for tough jobs. Check them out today at lifesavingsystems.com and follow them on Instagram at Rescue Gear at R E S Q G E A R. And we have Breeze Eastern. Since the very first helicopter rescue in November 1945, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions. While much of the technology and unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to us, the rescuers, and the operators, and those rescued, has not. Contact Breeze Eastern today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. That's breeze-eastern.com. I love it when I have an opportunity to talk to friends of mine and get them on the podcast with me. Uh, the fun part about this next guest is the fact that you know, when he comes on, he's like, man, I don't really have anything to tell you. It's I don't have any big cases or anything. And I laugh at that statement because I hear that a lot. And the fact of the matter is, every one of us are out there doing the job to go save somebody's life. Just because it seems like this benign, simple little hoist, you know, a simple rescue, doesn't mean it doesn't come with its own challenges. You don't have to have the big waves. You don't have to have the dark and stormy. The fact of the matter is you're going out, hoisting out of a perfectly good aircraft and going to save somebody's life. It's freaking fantastic is what it is. So these guys, if you look at a map and you look at Sacramento, California, it's in basically the very middle of the state. If you draw a big old circle around the majority of the state, that's their area of responsibility. So you have what's known as a grapevine, and we talk about that, but they're basically everything north of that area that they help and support going all the way over to Idaho and then all the way out to the coast. So without further ado, from Sacramento Metropolitan Fire Department, Mr. Ryan Ross. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. (laughs) 
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Real Rescue Podcast. I'd like to introduce my guest today, Mr. Ryan Ross. What's up, dude? How's it going, Quinny? It's very good. It's very good. Dude, thank you for coming on to the Real Rescue Podcast with me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I'm honored to join you. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I kind of like you guys and stuff. I mean, you know, it's, I'm just saying. It's, it's not personal or anything. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> it's we not bond to California. Right. You know, I left California. It's my little bond to California. <laughs> That's a bad word these days. Might not want to say it too much. Yeah, right. Ke- Kelly, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, Ryan, uh, if you could do me a favor and just kind of introduce yourself to everybody out there. Sure. Uh, Ryan Ross, uh, California born and raised, uh, originally from Los Angeles. Had the good fortune of being moved out of there at a young age by my folks after my dad retired. And uh, we grew up near Yosemite in the foothills out there. Um, course of life brought me to Sacramento through college and I was fortunate enough to find my dream career and uh, was able to land the job that I've always wanted and stayed put and been with uh, Sacramento Metropolitan Fire Department now for 15 years spent 12 of those years in the air operations division um, started off as a what we call a paramedic aerial observer it's basically the rescue firefighter uh, worked my way up through uh, tactical flight officer and was the program manager for about a year as well. So, um, been in the fire service doing uh fire and rescue work for a total of 21 years. Woo! And, Come on, uh, baby. 21 years. Stoked on the opportunity to be here now with you, dude. 21 years that's a long time. Yeah, it, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's funny to, to say it because it makes me feel old, but I guess you I shut can't. your mouth. I'm not old. You're, <laughs> you're definitely not old. <laughs> I, 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 they just catching me now, man. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's when you, but it I takes just had them. my first kid, so I'm still young, right? That's right. Absolutely. As long as, <laughs> as long as you can keep up with the kids or make the kids keep up with you, your money. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Oh my gosh. 21 years, man. That's, that's some, that's some good experience right there too. Um, so how did you get into like the fire rescue and specifically into air ops, uh, which for everybody else out there, Ryan works at the, on the Huey uh, with SAC Metro and the air operation side. Well, uh, not anymore. You're back on the truck now, correct? Yeah, I stepped out of air operations about a year ago. Uh, once my son was born, um, just, needed to be able to devote more time to the family so yeah just just regular so, station firefighter now right on right on but now so how did you land in fire ops as far as the heli ops uh well it was it, the interest started back when i was in college i was working for the forest service and park service in uh the wildland fire arena and nice. I was always on hand crews, and so I was never assigned to a aviation unit, but we always utilized helicopters to get flown into where we were going to go do our work. So got the exposure and kind of got the bug started back then. And when I graduated college and started looking for departments that I wanted to spend my career at, uh, Metro Fire um, was top on my radar. For one, I lived in Sacramento going to school there, and they had one of the only aviation programs. In fact, the only aviation program uh, north of the grapevine in California. And so at the time I got hired of the department, you had to be a captain in order to be qualified to work air operations. So I assumed it was going to be 10 years down the road before I was able to get a spot in the program. But um, a year and a half into my career, we hired a new chief pilot who, one of his stipulations, he wanted to revamp the entire program. And nice. included in that, he opened it up to the rank of firefighter to be a qualified crew member. So put in my application and stroke a lot, grace of God, all the above, I was able to get uh, interview well and, and got selected. So I was fresh off probation and starting a new role in air operations. And um, that's, that's basically how it all began. Man, that's awesome. So you got in uh, into the aviation side relatively early in your career. Relatively. Yeah, for sure. 
Cool, man. That's, that's great. Good for you. Um, so th- just to give everybody else a, a heads up out there, it, as far as what you guys do, cause you guys actually provide an interesting role. Um, so every, all the captains they, that were on the aircraft, uh, you guys are also like forward observers. So you're sitting up in the, in the forward left seat to be watching fire and directing guys on the ground to which way to go. And is that accurate? It is. Yeah. Um, we have what's called the tactical flight officer position and um, the way the program is structured, it's kind of reserved essentially for a captain level um, employee. And the reason for that is, yeah, you're in the front seat, you're running the radios, you're providing Intel to the command officer on the ground. You're making uh, tactical suggestions. We're not, you know, we're, we still work for whoever the battalion chief is that's running the incident, but we've got a, such a unique perspective on the fire that we make a lot of tactical suggestions to them. And they oftentimes will, will take our advice um, just because of the nature of the work that we're doing and some of the task level requirements that it, it ensues. It's basically been reserved to captains. Um, there have been a few of us that were grandfathered in from previous uh, administrations that were able to run that role prior to the rank of captain. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of what it entails. You're, you're, the pilot obviously has authority over the aircraft. Yeah, we make the suggestions on the, the the tactics we'd like to employ, and generally the pilots are able to do that without uh, any questions. But sometimes they'll make suggestions, you know, based on dynamics of the flight environment that we're not perceiving, and we'll just we we all coordinate and work together. That's that whole program, though there are ranks assigned to the individuals in it, we pride ourselves in the fact that we're not rank driven. We're very much uh, through resource management. That's our, 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 our main focus is getting everybody back on the ground safely at the end of the mission. Dude, that's awesome. Um, another thing that you guys do as tactical flight officers, you guys are also hoist operators. We are thanks to you. Yeah, hey. <laughs> but uh, which is which is interesting to me because um, if I remember correctly, and I don't know if the program is still the way it is now, but the tactical flight officers were the guys that were hoisting, and then your other firefighter paramedic guys would come on. And, and mind you, everybody that's a firefighter there in Sac Metro is also a paramedic, so everybody's qualified. Um, right. But your firefighter is the guy that's on the hook, so he's your rescue man per se. Right. And he's yep. the guy going down. So your tactical flight officer is always in the aircraft, either spotting fires. And then if you got to land and he changes rules and he jumps in the back, now he's a hoist operator and he just grabs one of you, one of the uh, firefighter guys. And now they're the rescue man on the end of the hook. Correct. Yeah. Yep. And when I tell you to watch you guys bring down all of your gear it is just awesome to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, uh, you know, to, to throw a major bone when we came out there and we were doing some training uh, myself and Pat Barber, you know, like we're throwing scenarios at you guys on the last day thinking, okay, we, we got to make this a little hard for these guys. Cause they're too good. <laughs> and it was, uh, yeah, we, we had a, we had a great time. I loved it. Loved it. That so. was a, a lasting relationship that I always looked forward to every year was getting together with you guys and doing that training because man, we, we grew so much through our affiliation with you and learned so much. And I mean, you can attest to the fact that we, we, we had an idea what we were doing, but we needed some serious polishing and you guys showed us some, some things that really improved our game. And I think that's, what's really put us on the trajectory that we're on now where we're, you know, we're out doing rescues regularly, confidently and safely. Yeah, which is awesome. And actually, I'd love to get into that right now. So if you could tell me your very first rescue that you remember, <laughs> and, and I, you know what, we just said this a minute ago, but I'm going to say it again. I, pulling a cat out of a tree, that might count. I'm just saying, fireman. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to focus on the helicopter 
So oh, okay, that. okay. That's, that's probably a good idea. <laughs> Um, that's love yeah, right there. Was, I just want you to know I'm giving you love. <laughs> <laughs> um, the very first one I was involved in, time wise, I don't remember exactly when it was, but I can tell you the crew. It was uh, Chuck Smith, who you are very familiar with, yep. big old teddy bear. He's yep. been flying Hueys for over 50 years, started at 18 in Vietnam, and still going strong. So um, he was our pilot. Uh, TJ Loris was our rescuer. And then I was the flight officer. And it wasn't too long after we had just finished up our training with you guys, it maybe been a month. And uh, we were just pulling a regular shift out at the station. And I think we'd flown a couple fires earlier in the day. And uh, we we're kind of starting to wind down a little bit. And <clears throat> The call comes in and, and it was so surreal because we've been training for years, you know, and very rarely did those dispatches ever come across our, our wire that when it finally did, <clears throat> I, I was just so nervous, man. I got struck <laughs> with like Parkinson. I'm sitting at the computer, like after I, I get off the phone with dispatch, I've got the, the details on the location, got my frequencies, got you know, my ground contacts and I'm, I'm doing a last minute, you know, weather check and um, site survey, look, pulling up Google maps of the area just to, to get my bearings. And I'm sitting there shaking so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Jay physically has to grab me and he's like, Hey, it's okay. We're ready for this. <laughs> Woo! Um, and so that was a, a good humbling moment there. But anyway, we, we took off and it was a swimming hole, uh, up in the foothills over kind of by Beale air force base. And, um, some kids were out swimming and they, they've got, uh, this pool that's surrounded by like 60 foot cliffs that guys just go cliff diving into the water. And somehow somebody didn't calculate their jump ride or whatever and had a, a leg I think it was a lower extremity injury and maybe a back injury or something Ooh, so man um we get up there and <clears throat> it was just like clockwork everything that we trained on came together well plugged in the coordinates and GPS took us right to where we needed to be um everybody was on the ground was on the frequencies we were told they were going to be on <laughs> so wow. we were to get, uh a good ground assessment from those guys. They actually already had the victim uh, um, immobilized and he was at the base of a cliff on the water's edge. So I uh, came in and scouted the site and did a, a rehearsal flight and everything looked good. So we came back around and uh, the plan was to send TJ down with a, a Bauman bag and a tagline, and we were just going to do a, a single up and then come back and um, retrieve TJ. And it was no more challenging than any scenario we'd run with you. We, yes! we had the wind was in perfect alignment running upriver. And so we just we followed the course of the water downstream. We had to crest a waterfall and then drop down another maybe 40 feet. And this guy was right on the edge of a pool right before another series of small falls. And so set TJ down, we had a target maybe four feet that we could land him on. And he kept his boots dry and was able to get off. And <clears throat> um, there, were, there were ground crews, like I said, that already had the guy packaged on a board. So. TJ instructed them on uh, getting them into the Bauman bag, set up a tagline. Um, Chuck and I went and landed off site, did a comms check. We had good combo with TJ. So we just sat at idle while he um, got everything set up. And then he called us in. We came in, sent a hook down, brought the, uh, brought the victim in and um, did a go around, came and grabbed TJ, and then they had already dispatched an air ambulance. So they were already sitting about a mile off site in the field, and we just shuttled over and transferred care and came back on like the most extreme adrenaline high that I've ever flown on. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that and, is awesome. 
it was it was so funny because it was the most simple rescue. <laughs> there, there was nothing really challenging about it, but it's because we had practiced that scenario so many times before that it felt routine. But um, like you know, that's clockwork, kind of, baby. That's Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, that's what kicked it off. And uh, once we got that pick, we were on the radar and we the the calls just started coming in much more frequently after that so man it was a lot of fun but man i was nervous <laughs> <laughs> good job dude i like clockwork i uh, i love the fact that you're coming over a waterfall and have to drop another 40 feet down that's yeah. that's something that you know like i you know with my world the you know ocean world that's not something I deal with. You know, you're coming into a ravine and next thing you know, you're dropping 40 feet because you got to clear a waterfall. You're like, oh, that's what? <laughs> Dude, that's <laughs> awesome. Nice. Yeah, it was pretty sick. Well done. Um, wow. Oh, dude, I love it. All right, so now <laughs> I, I'm going to move forward because if, uh, if you Google, you know, Metro Flight Air Ops, uh, there's a couple things that pop up. And you guys have a Twitter page and you guys have, you know, all these little different stories and stuff, but you know, you and I actually were just talking a little bit about, uh, you know, a kayaker that it got um, like a separated shoulder in the middle of a middle of a river. Um, right. And I, you were not on that one specifically, but if you can touch on that just a little bit, and then I'm going to ask some of your hairy ones that you might've been on. I'd love to hear them. Sure. Um, yeah, that one was um, a really interesting case. It was. It turns out that there's a there's a <clears throat> production company, Teton Research. They make all kinds of outdoor films for you know backcountry skiing, snowboarding, uh, kayaking, mountain biking, anything outdoor related, sport wise. They they're in the industry, and apparently there was a group of kayakers that were making their rounds around the country, hitting up some of the more iconic uh, rivers to do some some runs in their kayaks. And they're filming this thing as a documentary, essentially. And um, while they were in the Tahoe area, they were making a run down a pretty notorious section of river that's just very isolated. Um, it's, it's narrow, it's got a lot of waterfalls and the only access is either several hours of hiking or helicopter. And, wow. um, <clears throat> you know, the unfortunate part of their journey is that one of their cameramen going through one of the shoots ended up separating his shoulder. And so these guys were well prepared. They had sat phones and they had, um, you know, overnight gear and everything else. And so, Long story short, we end up getting a dispatch right as shift is about to end. Sun is just getting ready to set and we get a, a call for this kayaker stranded in the middle of the river up um, just out of the Tahoe area. So it's about a 40, 45 minute flight for us. So we get the coordinates, we get the con commo and we start doing our flight planning and it was apparent to us that <clears throat> our on scene time was going to be limited by our fuel. And so we started working on um, a plan on how we were going to get fuel and, and Truckee airport isn't too far from where this guy was located. So we knew that they have a, a fuel stop. So that was kind of our plan a, <laughs> so anyway, we get up there and um, by the time we get to the site, Sun's already set. We already planned for it to be a, a NVG operation. So everyone's already got goggles on. And <clears throat> we start looking for these landmarks that we were told to um, be on the lookout for. And sure enough, man, clear as day, here's this footbridge that crosses the river that we were told was a potential landmark. And then near that footbridge, there's probably 20 kayaks and 20 kayakers on the shore. And it was obvious that they were, they'd pulled off the water and they were setting up camp. And so um, we thought that's gotta be our target because there's not many people that run this river and yeah. to find a group that big, they've gotta be a part of that. So yeah. um, <clears throat> we we set up a rehearsal, we, we make a pass and 
find a good spot to set TJ again. It was TJ on this one with me. This time we had uh, Brian Combs as our pilot. And uh, we do an insertion and get TJ on the deck. And you know TJ. <laughs> He's totally. a character. As soon as he gets on the deck, these 20 kayakers start congregating around him. And he opens his arms. He's all, bring me your sick and injured. <laughs> <laughs> And they're like, wrong group, bro. <laughs> so long story, apparently there were there were more than just this one group of kayakers on the water, and we picked the wrong one. So <laughs> he tells us, hey, this is no joy. So we come back around, pick him up. And so the search begins again, and we're, we're patrolling the river for probably another 20 minutes. And I keep getting these, like, flickers of light way down in this hole. And I'm thinking... There's no way that's them, but we focus some more attention and <clears throat> it's the only other logical option on who, where somebody could be. And you're in the middle of the wilderness and to see flickers of light like that is obviously not natural. So we pretty much identified, okay, that's got to be our target, but now we're, we're getting close to bingo fuel. So yeah. we end up uh, heading up to Truckee and um, fueling up. And by the time we came back, this was just, it was a bad night to try to do a, an NVG operation. There was no moonlight. There was very little star light at that point. And we were deep in a ravine. And so it was as dark as dark can be. So you can pick out, you know, really pixelated trees, but yeah. you've got no real features on the land to be able to identify and so I've got the IR laser and I'm shining it down in the hole and it's doing a decent job illuminating, but it's just illuminating the immediate target area, but I can't clear hazards anywhere else. So we made a couple of passes to see how, how far down we could get. And we were probably still 400 feet above these guys and we we're getting past our comfort level. So we, we decided, you know what, we've got their position marked. Let's go back send a crew up in the morning, which is what we did. I, um, we got back to base, I think around three in the morning. I called Bryce, who was gonna be the flight officer on duty the next day and told him, hey man, we, we had this mission. We're unsuccessful on the rescue, but we know where they're at. As soon as you can get these guys geared up, let's get back up there and, and do it. And so, you know, he's a bulldog. As soon as he heard that, he, I don't think he went back to bed. He was <laughs> no way. Planet, not, not Bryce. Bryce. Yeah. Bryce is rolling hard. Oh, baby, let's get this food. I love Bryce. So, uh, uh, he and Derek were on duty and they came in <clears throat> as soon as sun broke, they were off the ground and, and got up there. And I think they had the guy rescued and they were back in quarters by like 7.30 in the morning. But the crazy thing is, this uh, hole that this guy was in couldn't have been any deeper. If it was, they wouldn't have been able to rescue him because we've got 250 foot cable on our hoist, 241 feet of usable cable, yep. and they had 235 feet paid out to get Derek <laughs> on the ground, get him packaged, and get him up. But the or the or the kind of cool thing about this is this was one of their cameramen for this documentary. And yeah. so this whole rescue got captured and clips of it ended up in their, <laughs> their video. For this. Yes. Oh, that is awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was pretty, pretty wild. <laughs> you know, if you got to save a guy, you might as well save the camera guy. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out. Wow. Man, 235 feet, you said? Yeah. That's they pretty awesome. Just about maxed out. Yeah, the uh, now the the Twitter stuff, like the videos, the little clips I had seen on Twitter, is is pretty awesome too. Because you guys have the belly tank is still on the aircraft, and and you guys are just rolling in like you're in trees in this ravine. It pretty sick. So yeah, solid job for those guys too. God, yeah, oh, did an awesome, awesome job. That was that <laughs> was a pretty technical rescue. Dude, that's so funny. Especially going to the wrong group first. Bring me your sick yeah. injured. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh i love it nice all right so now i want to move on a little bit further to some of your 
I, I'll take one or I'll take two, whatever you want to give me some of the, the very memorable cases, the ones that really stand out to you and you can go into lessons learned from some of them. Um, but you guys just have such a unique area, you know, that you're responding to. Cause I, I mean, not only do you do rescue, you guys are out all the time fighting fires. And I remember specifically calling you one time and saying, Hey, what, what are you guys doing? Da, 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 da. And you're like, yeah, dude, I, I'm not home. I haven't been home in like a month. I'm out in such and such area. I think you were up uh, north of Napa fighting that big fire up there. And you've right. been out there forever. And, and from my aspect, because I was living in California at the time, 101 was closed. Uh, I-5 was almost closed. You had all the side roads because Route 20 was closed. And it was all because of that fire. So Yeah, the Mendocino complex at the time, it was the largest fire in the state's history. And that's that record has since been smashed but but yeah we uh we were doing <clears throat> um standbys basically rescue standbys we were kern county in southern california we, you know once you get into southern california every fire department has an aviation program and, and everybody all, has a hoist and they're all busy <laughs> well totally. part of the grapevine it's us and so Kern so for everybody out there real quick the grapevine as we call it in california basically <laughs> there's a mountain pass. So when you get north of LA, you hit this mountain pass called the Grapevine. And then just north of that, you get into Bakersfield and then farmland uh, going right up the coast, you know, or going right up the central bit of California. Right. And then on the West coast or to, right to the coast, you have a little mountain pass there that goes up into San Francisco and then runs all the way up. So again, Grapevine is just north of LA basically. And then yeah. oh, you have Northern California from there. Pretty much, yeah. And Kern County covers the grapevine and they go as far north as Bakersfield and they they set the precedence. They they paved the road that we followed nice. as far as getting these uh, rescue standby uh, contracts with the state and the feds. And so they were they were doing it for years before we were able to um and get the contracts inked and and get this kind of work ourselves and so yeah that's what we would end up doing was um you know a big fire would break out and as a force protection for the firefighters they wanted a rescue helicopter on standby and so we'll we will go out and basically we're assigned to a fire for the sole purpose of providing hoist rescue in case of uh an event where a firefighter gets sick, injured, whatever the case may be, we'll, yeah. we'll go pick them up. And we, you know, everyone's a paramedic, so we can provide ALS care to hospital or to another air ambulance for transfer, whatever the case may be. So, yeah, that's that's what I was doing when you called. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, to, to go back to your, your previous question, though, um, you know, you alluded to the fact that we've got a unique area. We cover a lot of terrain, and, and it's true. We we frequently are in Tahoe um, performing uh, rescues up there. We, we've been into San Francisco Bay. We've done hoist training uh, in the actual bay, uh, doing vessel picks. Um, we cover Sacramento Valley, which is as flat as can be, and everything in between. So... Um, for us as a rescue crew, you really have to <clears throat> be versatile to be able to adapt to the different environments that you're in. Um, and the good fortune for us is we've got, I mean, everybody probably says this about their program, but we've got the best pilots. All of our guys were career army pilots and they're studs. They've been through mountain flying courses. They, they, know the Huey and how to manage its power and you know that paid off big time uh, for one of our cases we had it was up in the desolation wilderness in Tahoe and I think the elevation of the the rescue it was uh, a guy was out on the Rubicon trail and uh, got bucked off his quad and had a femur fracture and I think he was at like 9600 feet is Ooh, where wow. this accident occurred and so um we we headed up there and 
we were able to make the rescue in our initial plan because of where he was <clears throat> and the, the, the terrain that it offered us, it was pretty wide open. So it wasn't very technical at all. It was going to be a pretty simple rescue. So our plan initially was to just do send the rescuer down and then do a two up, bring him in and, and off we would go. But we quickly learned that we were running out of, uh, <laughs> of uh, right pedal in that tail rotor so holy cow we were we were on you know we we're maxing out our our ability at that altitude to bring on too much more weight so <clears throat> sent bryce down um the plan like i said initially he was just going to package them as a double up and they were going to come in but as we were setting bryce out we realized okay the winds weren't as favorable as we thought they were a little more um sporadic than steady and in order to keep the aircraft in trim, we were using a lot more power than we had planned on. So we ch changed course during the, the operation and decided we were just going to do a single up. And um, the, the rescue site wasn't, distance wise, wasn't far from where an air ambulance had already landed to try to do the uh, a ground retrieval of the guy. And so once we had the victim on board, we just told Bryce, hey, man, you're going to have to RTO on foot. And so um, he and the... It's only the 15 pilot, miles. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Fortunately, it was much shorter than that. But, uh, uh, just borrow the ATV that the dude just wrecked his leg on, and I'll see yeah. you back in. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm sorry for the guy that got injured. Your ATV is fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, here's the crazy thing on that story. So we're... I don't know, we're maybe 100 miles from Sacramento. Flight time is maybe 35, 40 minutes. And so that's an area that a lot of guys from work recreate routinely. And we land, and once Bryce and the, the flight crew from their ambulance get back up to where we landed, we start transferring this guy over, and his brother that he had been riding quads with walks up to the helicopter, and it's a guy that I work with. You know, oh no way together. yeah and uh so he and i had gone through the academy together so we've got a great personal relationship and i see him <laughs> and here we are in the middle of the wilderness and i'm just like what in the world are you doing and uh, he's like, oh, it's my brother so it was kind of cool because you know felt like we got to rescue one of our own so it, it paid off but um that was a really good experience though on understanding you know performance planning weight and balance power management all those sorts of things that really do play a critical role in the rescue environment so yeah um well, especially at 9600 feet you're i mean you're up there yeah for sure so right. that was air a, gets a little thin at that altitude and then all of a sudden <laughs> you're like oh come on i need just a little more lift <laughs> yeah um you know what? So there, there's two things that I, I want to touch on with that, because that's awesome. And the first one is you guys came in with a, a brief plan. And then when you got in there, it didn't work and, and you adapted and overcame immediately. So as soon as you put Bryce in, you're like, you know what? We need to change that because that's that's not going to happen. So you came in with that whole secondary. All right, we're just going to pick the patient up and then roll over to the other LZ and then, then trade off. I think that's awesome. The other thing that's amazing about that is the fact that you guys, like you said, you're everybody's paramedic. So you have a paramedic on the ground that's treating the patient, loading the patient or packaging the patient, and then boom, you hoist him, even though it's a patient coming up alone, Bryce can kick all the medical gear with him, boom, you get in the aircraft, now you can treat him. Now you're just taking over his job. That right. is awesome. Yeah, it makes for good continuity of care. It really opens up our options on how we can affect a rescue and, and still provide the top level service to that patient. So yeah, it's, it's a unique facet for us and, and it's proven successful so far. Man, great job, dude, that's awesome. <laughs> and then high five your buddy. Hey, it's key. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome all right man keep keep it going dude i'm loving this <laughs> um 
Well, you know, you, you saw the progression of our program. You were integral in a lot of the development that we had, but one of our big goals was to be a night hoist operation. And, yes. you know, that's not something that you want to just jump into. You, you have to, it's got to be a calculated move and you've got to have the right players in place with the right training and the right equipment and, and the right mentors to make sure that you're evaluating everything before you actually commit to that. Then fortunately we had really good support from our administration and the program to be able to, to allow it to develop into that. So it definitely, <clears throat> it didn't happen. It, I was there 12 years and it wasn't until the last three, so nine years of, of planning to become a night program nice. and yeah. three years of execution in which it still is, is operating as a, a, a 24 hour system now. But um, the, the exciting thing with that is I got to be on the pendant for our first official night hoist too. Yes. So um, that was, it was actually that fire that we were just talking about. It was the Mendocino complex. There was a, a incident one night where uh, one of the firefighters got, um, you know, basically it was a environmental emergency. It wasn't a, a, a medical or a, an injury, fortunately, but nonetheless, um, the guy needed help off the line. So um, we got the dispatch right around midnight and you know we had our our day crew who had been on during the day the night crew we came on um just before sundown so we had had the full brief on you know communications and orientation to the fire and got our maps and uh everyone had their goggles in position and on their helmets and ready to go and so that was our sole purpose was if an event happened we were we would be ready to go and so Long story short, it came out. Um, we were able to go in and located the guy right away, no problem. I mean, there was good communication throughout the whole incident. They led us right to him. Uh, we were able to make a good assessment. It was actually a pretty simple insertion. The guy was um, near a road, but the proximity to any, any resource on the ground because of the remote nature of the fire, it was a, a long drive and a very short flight. So um, we were able to come up with a, our plan once we got on scene and <clears throat> we inserted uh, Nick and he got down on the ground, got the pack, patient packaged and we we're airborne with the with two of them back to the uh, hell base where we then met a ground ambulance and passed the guy on. and. Got him over to the hospital. So again, like that first rescue that we talked about, yeah. this one was very simple. <laughs> <laughs> but all the nuances of being new, just it, in my mind, I'm making it more complex than it needed to be. But once we got on the ground and got a chance to decompress, it, we just laughed. We're like, that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just, you know, it goes to the, a testament to the fact that, you know, the training we did with you guys, I think you guys made life so much more difficult for us in the training world that Good. the real world scenarios have been so simple. <laughs> hey, that's awesome. I would rather it be that way than the other way around. That is yes, sure. absolutely. Man, you guys, that's awesome. Uh, and all your night stuff now, I mean, like you talking about that and this is for every operator out there if you are not doing this at night man heed this advice take your time there are Absolutely. things that happen at night that you just don't understand and until you start training at night man it's it's another world and it's gotta slow down everything at night slows down you need a couple little tips and tricks some flashlights some chem lights some this some that you know absolutely so yeah, all the above for sure Dude, these are awesome stories, man. Thank you for sharing. Holy cow. <laughs> what seems like, you know, you look back at some of them and I think of some of mine, like, ah, oh, that was really easy. But my God, <laughs> at the time you're like, ah! <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Well, uh, so I want to I open the floor up to you. Um, 
and really any any advice that you want to give to anybody or anything you want to you want to talk about um man i would be all about it uh, because you guys like you said you you've been doing this you know yourself or you did yourself for nine years ten years um you know you guys have built an amazing program down there uh and i i've been blessed to be able to see it grow as far as it has and in, in talking to all of you guys just from time to time you're like dude you're never gonna believe what happened to us and i'm like yeah <laughs> so i i get excited about it as well but you know what what would you bring to the table well i i think we've alluded to it quite a bit during our conversation tonight but the thing that really stands out to me is the importance of networking and and training and reaching out for outside training. And that's how our relationship began. You're, yeah. are, did I mention who you work for? Uh, you, that- yeah, so back then I, I came down with Priority One Air Rescue, great training company. They have some amazing instructors over there. Um, right. I am no longer with them, but yeah, a great yeah. company. And so that was, that's what really was, what that was the springboard what really pushed our program forward is the fact that we realized our shortcomings and that you know what we we're all professionals and we're all competent but we don't know what we don't know so we need to go outside of ourselves and and be educated and so we made that relationship with you through priority one and it's still going on in fact i think they're they're scheduled to be getting together again in like the next few weeks, you know, that oh, that's program, great. Or that relationship is going to go on for eternity, I'm sure, as long as the programs are still in in operation. But yeah, um, and it goes way beyond the rescue side of things. Whatever type of flying you're doing, there is a community out there of professionals involved in it, and not everybody knows everything. And let's learn lessons from each other. Let's not repeat the same mistakes. Go out and network, go to things like yeah. Helicopter Association International, join the rescue summits, join yeah. the-, the Goodrich, um, Goodrich conferences. Goodrich conference, yeah. absolutely. Go network with the others in the industry yeah. and, and take each other's advice, learn from each other's hardships yeah. and train with outside parties. and. That's that's the thing that I think benefited us the most is we were we had our issues and we we were very transparent. We took those problems we put together. We had an accident that, um, you know, fortunately it it only resulted in a crew member's hospitalization for a short time. Yeah. It could have been the end of our air operations program forever, and we analyzed it and came up with a very specific set of lessons learned. And we realized that we're doing a disservice to the helicopter rescue community if we don't go out and share this. So, you know, we put together a presentation the next year and went to HAI and went to the rescue summit and the Goodrich conference and, and asked, hey, can we share this and present it? And obviously they're they're welcome to that kind of um, content. So <clears throat> we were able to get our lessons learned out to others. and. You know, that's not unique to us. There's plenty of groups in this rescue world that want to share and that do share routinely. Um, you know, I've listened to, to Travis County um, put on a presentation. I've listened to Las Vegas Metro Police put on a presentation. And mm-hmm. the whole purpose is we realize that it's a dangerous bit of work that we do. And the more that we can share with each other, the lessons that we've learned in our hardships, the the more likely we're, we are to prevent those from being repeated. So don't have an ego in this industry. Please yeah. go seek uh, opportunities to train outside of your program. Find the leaders in the industry and and learn their lessons and network. That's that's my biggest takeaway. I could always always will encourage people. To- Man, I, I cannot agree with you more. Um, you know, when I got out of the Coast Guard and started going around to all these different agencies and programs, and when you start seeing what other people do and how they do it, you start picking things up, you know, that you like, and then things you're like, ah, man, I would change this just a little bit here. And man, it, 
Yeah, it's it's a it's amazing. There are some companies out there and some agencies that you know they have a, an incident and they, and they want to they want to bury it. Oh, don't don't tell anyone that. We we can't let that out. But man, please don't. Like you said, put your pride aside. Be humble about it. Come out and say, hey, we had an accident. You know, it could be something as simple. Nobody could be getting gotta have gotten hurt. And sure. you know, just just say, you know what? This happened. And uh, I remember specifically for me hoisting, I was out training one day and I had a really bad spin under the aircraft, like a full oscillation underneath. It was totally my fault. Uh, there were no incidents, there was no issues. The cable was totally fine. We went into forward flight, we fixed the incident, corrected it and moved on. But I have that video and it was like, oh, oh yeah, this actually happens. And this happens a lot. And then I, I've dropped this already once, but uh, you know, you look at Phoenix Fire, man, they had a terrible spin. That's an easy fix. Sure. Simple. And, and you just gotta put your pride aside. Yeah, we have a great training program. I'm sure you do. I have no doubt you have an amazing training program. Take somebody else's advice just a little bit and see how much more and how much your training program will expand. So, sure. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I'm all about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, look at what the opportunities it presents. I'm here hey, you. it's you and me, <laughs> baby. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I, I almost had your kid named after me, I was so close. <laughs> <laughs> all right so your wife said absolutely not but whatever i was trying <laughs> hey, i i pushed for it we'll see <laughs> oh gosh man back to that networking though it's um you know you guys instilled in us the importance of the tagline and i i can attest to the truth in that and the validity for it but the other side of that too, um, Airs Vermont, you know, they, they present regularly at this conference that we attend and they're in a completely different environment, but they, they use forward flight to accomplish the same, same thing. Agreed. And so, um, our program after I left, I've been I still keeping close tabs with the guys and, and keep up with their training and whatnot. And they've been implementing that as well so that they have the option now you know if they're in a area where a tagline is impractical or, or potentially dangerous because of the the coverage around where they're doing their pick they're working where they instigate or they they initiate forward flight to provide that same stability so yeah you know there's always there's always something to be learned out there and don't be afraid to try it and try right. it in the training environment before you need to use yeah, it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, and I, you know, I, I, I'm going to piggyback off that one too, because I really like that you know, you've taken another option. You've given yourself another option. That's a lot of where people get in their, uh, in their world or they confine themselves to, we can only do it this way. No, 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 no. That's the first mistake open yourself up and have options to do an option as simple as it sounds your static discharge cable you don't have to use it every time but if you know there's a thunderstorm within 10 miles maybe you want it on the on the end of the hook let it ground out and and boom if it if it's clear blue 22 hey grab that hook don't be a whip <laughs> Get a little zap. Whatever. No, but I mean, in all reality, it, if that's something that you want as a rescuer, because you're, you've been zapped before and, and you want to, you're, you're a little nervous about it, put a discharge cable on it. It doesn't hurt anything. For sure. You know, it's that simple option, you know, and, and I know that we're talking, you know, flight ops versus, you know, forward airspeed versus a little, a little static, but it's an option. I like options. Absolutely. You always want more tools in your toolbox. Totally. As so. long as you know how to use them. <laughs> Make sure you know how to use them. Good <laughs> Lord. Because <laughs> then I'll have you on here and I'll be making fun of you. No, that's terrible. I'm just not. <laughs> oh, man. Well, Ryan, I, I listen, I don't want to take too much more of your time. Uh, if you got anything else to say, any words of wisdom to pass on? Anything else? 
I don't have anything worth listening to. <laughs> Whatever. And everything you say is worth listening to. What are you talking about? You're in charge of stuff. <laughs> No, I just want to, again, thank you for this opportunity. This is, it's a humbling experience having you ask me to join you. So thank you. Um, it's been fun, man. Yeah, totally. Well, and, and I thank you as well. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Real Rescue Podcast. Please take a minute and like my daughters like to tell me, like and subscribe. Oh yeah. I'm pulling chocks and taking off. But before I go, if anyone out there has a rescue story that they would be willing to share, I would be humbled and honored to have you as a guest. Or if you have any questions about any of the rescues or anything else that we talk about here on this podcast, send me an email, therealrescue at gmail.com. That's T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q at gmail.com. You can also check us out on our Facebook and Instagram page at The Real Rescue. That's at T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q. I also want to give a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today. Always remember that when that SAR alarm goes off, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard.